everybody, welcome to my YouTube channel. I am Jessica Henry and today I am welcoming you to my studio. Come on in, I have a fun idea today. Today I am inviting you to my studio. I wanna give you a tour of the studio and talk about essentials that people need just to get going on oil painting in the studio. As summer months come to a close and I'm thinking about doing a lot less plein air painting and getting back into the studio, I thought this was a perfect time to really take you in here and show you a little bit more of the foundational basics that you need to get going in your studio. need very much in a studio to get going. This is sort of a behind the scenes look of what I have going on in my studio and I'm always rearranging my format. Sometimes the easel's on one side, sometimes it's on the other, sometimes my workstation is a little higher and currently I'm going to be working on a portrait. So I have a chair set up over here with different fabrics that I may want to try on my model different lighting that I want to try. And I keep a flat background pinned to my wall and that is just a felt fabric, just tacked up there. It's non-reflective, so I like that for my backgrounds. Uh, over here I have my drafting table and I have a big bag of watercolor paper down there and I just keep it really simple. Not a whole lot um, that you need to make this happen. So I've got my watercolor paper, my pencils, brushes, paints, jars, and some paper towels. That's about it. I, this whole wall over there is all natural windows, but the problem is, is that faces the east. And so I only get a little bit of light in the morning. So I close it all off and I use artificial lighting sometimes because I'm able to work later into the night and um, get a lot more done that way. This is my easel. I do like a big sturdy easel to work on. And sometimes I sit while I paint, other times I don't. I do keep a hard plastic surface under my chair because inevitably I drop my brushes once in a while. Um, so that is where I work. And I keep my brushes that I use most frequently um, just next to me. I've got a little cauldron there. and. This is my portable workstation. Sometimes I put it on one side, sometimes on the other. This table, I also will move to the other side or this side or raise the surface to make for still life, uh, uh, a higher surface for still life painting. So I just, I keep this so streamlined that there's really not much to it. Um, I keep all my chemicals down there. I have the glue for gluing linen pieces down to masonite panel that is neutral pH adhesive. We'll get, I'll talk more about all those chemicals in a little bit. I also want to show you my palettes that I make and sell and my brushes and what colors I use. So we'll get into all that today too. The key to a happy studio is to make it a sanctuary where you feel warm and invited and that it's a place that you want to go and just relax and get away from the world. I have a nice couch in my studio because I want to sit in here sometimes and just meditate and study and read books, light a candle, and just get away from everything. I have um, a few books that I've been working through lately. I did read these while I went to the atelier, and these are excellent for anyone beginning their journeys or in any stage of their process of studying art. The Practice and Science of Drawing by Harold Speed, I strongly recommend. Uh, he was popular back mm, about a hundred years ago or so, and um, excellent drawing, very, very well written. And it was this this book and this writing that developed sort of an epiphany for me where I realized everything is possible. There isn't anything you can't draw um, just by employing some of the um, techniques in there. He also wrote one called oil painting techniques and materials, another one I strongly recommend. These are both by Dover, and you can see I paid 
even if the price has gone up a bit, they're not going to be very much. And you could probably find them on Amazon for cheaper too. Uh, again, just really spent a lot of time pouring over this. Excellent books for just um, getting the basics as well as more technical. And this book is pretty much the Bible of every studio, The Art Spirit by Robert Henry. And um, I strongly recommend this. These were notes taken from different students during his teaching and um, just profound advice that it's not necessarily a technical how-to, but it gets more to the heart of the matter, which is something that is more difficult to teach than anything. Anyone can teach technique and you can um, get extremely proficient at it, but what you can't teach is more the philosophy and what's at the heart of painting, but he masters it in that book. So I strongly recommend that one. Also by Dover, really affordably priced. These studio lights you can find on Amazon, any kind of um, studio lights that have removable or movable flaps. This one is more for photography, but I like it because I can soften the light. And then I have one over here that I put on my model. It's a little bit warmer light bulb. It's an incandescent bulb. And that one over there is a cool daylight bulb. This one is just soft white. And so you can have different bulbs in your studio to try different things and see what sort of effect you get from that way. But be careful that you don't drench your canvas in too much light or an incandescent bulb. I have learned from experience painting with an incandescent bulb that warms it up so much you'll paint the entire painting blue tones without realizing you're doing it. Um, and you won't know until you take it into another room. Same with if you go with too strong of a light right on your canvas, your painting will end up being too dark because you naturally compensate. Okay, so an important part of your studio experience is your palette. Now your palette is your workhorse. It is like the instrument that you use to create your music. So I want to show you the palettes that I have made and um, we market and sell these. This one is my um, larger size and it's about 20 inches across by about 14 inches tall. This pattern and design was um, taken from when I went to the atelier, one of the alumnus from the school went to Bouguereau's studio in Paris and he was allowed to take a pattern of Bouguereau's actual palette brought that back to the atelier and all of us students were able to make a copy of the same pattern. So that is where this design comes from as well as the counterweight on the back. So this, this weight here is mathematically designed so that when you put the paint on it up here, it balances perfectly and you can hold it for long hours in the studio and I love that. I have used this palette for about 25 years and it is something indispensable I'd be lost without. I haven't used this particular palette. I've used my first one I had for 23 years. This one is a newer one that I've made since then. But um, we do make these and sell them. There's a, gonna be a link below. I'll show you about this palette. It's this wonderful contouring where your hand goes. It is designed and shaped to fit your hand comfortably, ergonomically for long hours in the studio. All around here and in here as well as on the back so that your as your thumb slides in like this it's it doesn't get that sharp corner abrasive right there so you can hold this for long hours sometimes I sit down on my chair and I just set it on my lap but either way this is specifically designed by an artist for artists because I understand your needs it's also made of quarter both of them are quarter inch birch plywood because as they age they stay a nice neutral tone and you want a neutral tone for your palettes. No dark walnuts, no cherry, no, you don't want other colors of your wood because that affects your color choices when you're mixing your paints as well as your value choices. So you want it to be neutral toned, which is why wood has been a popular painting surface for hundreds if not thousands of years. I have just recently opened up offering a smaller palette, this one. So I'll show you in comparison the size. So this one fits about like that on this guy. And um, this is for, it's left and right handed. It does not have the counterweight, but it's so small it doesn't really need one. So we are making it so that you can just, it has all the same contours, both this side and this side, and it fits any hand size. Originally I did, made it for children, but we altered the design a little bit 
from the big one to make it so that anyone could use it. It's, it's suitable for any hand size. So that is that, and it's really nicely contoured around the edges. And these grooves here fit right into your arm space, just like this. So you can use this out in the field planner painting or in the studio. Um, and in fact, it's small too, for the reason of I use just a limited palette when I teach. I think it's excellent and most important for people to, especially to begin with a limited palette because you learn to um, maximize your mixing with minimum amount of color and you really grow and develop that way. You're not overwhelmed by 47 choices. All right, so I'm gonna show you how I set up my palette next. Okay, so here on my palette, I have my paints just set up the way I normally like them. I'm going to put a little more, bit more paint out here just to show you how. This is how I normally uh, will set up my palette. And I will just show you the colors that I use and where I put them. You can put your colors wherever you want, but the, the key is to keep them in the same place. And I have chosen to put my paints in this specific way for this reason, and I'll show you what my logic is. So I do like Gamblin paints. Um, I, there are other brands I like as well. I just stick with these because they're the middle of the road economically and their quality is wonderful. So I'm happy with Gamblin. I use their titanium white. There are lots of different kinds of whites out there on the market. I like titanium because it's just the middle of the road in whiteness. It, zinc white has a lot of chemicals and zinc that I don't really want in my paints. And um, anyway, flake white, again, a lot of lead. So sticking with titanium, I use cadmium yellow medium because it is just sort of a generic standard yellow. Occasionally I will use a cadmium red light. Now I buy this one of the 1980 brand of Gamblin. This is so named 1980 because back in 1980, the prices of oil paints are how they priced this line of their paints. So they are a little bit cheaper priced than their regular lines. So they have a line of, Gamblin has a line of paints that are a little cheaper because they add a little bit more filler and they're not as high a quality as these. However, for the cadmium red light, given that it's uh, about a $36 tube of paint at normal price, I buy the cheaper one because I use such a tiny, tiny amount. And the quality is still really good at that little tiny amount. So 1980. This is Cad Yellow Medium, and this is also very expensive too, but I, I use it anyway. I like it. Um, okay, so Yellow Ochre right there. Um, earth Tone colors are usually a lot cheaper because they're just easier to manufacture, cheaper. Burnt Sienna, Ultramarine Blue, Thalo Green, and alizarin crimson you can get alizarin permanent alizarin permanent is actually better i'm just using this up because i had it um, they're the same color but alizarin permanent is better for light fastness it, it won't fade as fast in the light as alizarin crimson same color though same price too all right so i'm going to put some of this out and i want to show you a little bit today about the different qualities i have some over here some other brands that I have used that I absolutely abhor these paints. <laughs> and I will tell you why. <laughs> so um, brand wise, the Utrecht Studio Series, this, this was bought for me and this I bought because I had no other choice. They didn't have Gamblin paint. And I will tell you why these are bad soon. Let me put some paint out. There's enough of that out, there's enough of that out. I don't really need that. Let's put some more blue out. And I think I'm good on those. All right, and I also keep on my palette a palette cup. And I like to put different mediums in there while I'm painting. I have been using linseed oil. I put it in this container because it's easier and smaller, especially for taking out in the field. I just can squirt a little bit in my palette cup as needed. Sometimes I'll put other mediums in there that I'm gonna be working with, glazing mediums, whatever. To start out with, since this is just a foundational beginner, video i'm just going to stick with super simple linseed oil okay so now i want to show you a little bit about quality i'm going to put a little bit of this paint out utrecht studio oil whenever you have studio series series one or you have um, student grade 
just run for the hills. Don't buy that. It, I think that they do that because they think, well, students just want the cheap stuff because, you know, they're beginning. Um, really don't do that because it, it will um, aggravate you and cause you to want to quit more than anything. So I have um, some canvas scraps here. This is a scrap of linen that I will show you. A little bit of the difference here, just to make my point. So I'm taking just a brush, and we'll talk about brushes here soon. I want to show you a little bit about, this is the Studio Grade Utre Utrecht Ultramarine Blue. Okay, so I took a bit from the brush, and I'm painting it on like that. In this little container over here, I have odorless mineral spirits. Now some people prefer not to use that in their studio. I have been using it for about 30 years, or some equivalent of it, for about 30 years. And it works for me, but the smell, there is a smell, even though it says odorless. So you're gonna want to put a fan on and have some sort of ventilation in your studio. Next color, Winton. Winton is the lower grade Windsor and Newton brand of oil paints. It's kind of like their version of the Gamblin 1980, but this is Winton, and I don't love it either. Okay, so we're taking some of this, also ultramarine blue, and you can see the color is a little bit richer. Okay. And now I'm gonna take Gamblin ultramarine blue farther. So I could paint this all over this entire canvas because that's called color payout, okay? This color, the pigmentation in the Gamblin tube of paint is much, much more concentrated than these two tubes because these two are, they have filler in there. So what that means too is if I were to take th this amount of blue with say, let's just take the same amount of burnt sienna and I mix those two together, it takes a lot to um, get that, get the color dark enough by using that. So this was the first one, mixing part one part blue, one part brown, okay? So now I'm gonna take Winton and do one part, which is about the tip of my brush, one part blue and about one part brown and mix those two together. I think I got a little more brown than blue, so. That's weaker still. Okay, wiping my brush off. Now I'm gonna take one part, that's a large part, one part Gamblin Blue, and one part, is that about the same? But one part Burnt Sienna. And mixing those two together, I can get a much stronger dark. Okay, I don't know if there's a glare on that, but the impact that that has while you're out in the field painting is profound. Because if you have an area where you need to get it really dark, I can't do it if I'm fighting to try to get enough color pigmentation payout from a cheap tube of paint. So I'm standing there using huge amounts of blue with a little bit of brown to try to get it as dark as I need, which is wasting time. And with, especially with plein air, you don't have a lot of time. And it's annoying. <laughs> All right, so I hope that that helps with quality and brand. You do not need to buy the most expensive brand, but I do recommend a brand that is not gonna aggravate. Okay, so I also feel the same way about brushes. There are many different kinds of brushes, and I like to get, kind of, again, about the middle of the road brush. Uh, a lot of people love rosemary brushes, and I have a few of those. I absolutely adore them. Uh, they're out of England. I also really like um, just uh, Signet series, and I can show you some of those. I Sometimes I will buy these, and these are really, really um, not that expensive, but they're not super cheap either. 
but I like them because the furrow, this part here, is black. And so when I'm out doing plein air painting, um, that black doesn't pick up the sun as opposed to these kinds of brushes that pick up a lot of the light and the sunshine and it's it, it'll glare and before I know it I'm squinting my eyes are watering and I, 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 I get frustrated using the silver ones if you're painting in some shade then it's not so much of a problem but oftentimes I'm filming and so filming I have to be out in the at least the painting has to be in the direct Sun so I'm getting this glare so you can see it <laughs> all right so that is that so this brand is called it's by Princeton and it is Aspen this is a size 6 and this shape is a filbert okay and I like that but I, I pretty much I prefer more of a flat I can get a chiseled edge and I just enjoy working with it um, and I typically will buy two four six and eight in size okay, so now um, the difference between hogs hair brush and synthetic synthetic brushes and these are synthetic um, they're made with a plastic fiber okay plastic fiber is if you can see it under a microscope is slick it's really smooth most oil painting brushes are made with hogs hair and they are just so you know for all my vegan friends uh, no hog <laughs> hogs are not killed in the making of hogs hair brushes they keep them alive because they are providing them with hair so they just cut the hairs off and they make the brushes with them uh, so these hairs themselves if you can look, them, look at them under a microscope, you've probably seen human hair under a microscope, and they have sort of that scaly-like texture on each one of the fibers here. Uh, that being the case, when you're working with the bristle brushes, they're stiffer and they hold a whole lot more paint inside the br brush, whereas a synthetic is smooth. So these are fine for you know simple light work, but if you're trying to get a lot of paint on the brush and on your canvas, they don't hold a lot up in these bristles okay you can get some of these brushes that are mixed synthetic and natural and those are fine too you just have to see what works for you because sometimes you might come across something that just really speaks your language maybe you like to paint with a thinner paint and the synthetic brush would work for you or you like a softer more of a mongoose rosemary makes a wonderful line of mongoose mongoose brushes um, anyway so that's that's a personal preference but when you're buying brushes and, and it's really kind of best to buy them in person if you can if you have to order them for example if you order them from rosemary you can trust that whatever you get is going to be good um, but when you're in the store and you're buying brushes i encourage you to break the glue out of the brush just break it out when you're standing there and look at the brush if you have some bristles this is an old brush so i'm using this as an example if you have some bristles that do you're kind of splayed you don't want that brush um, so keep looking break out another one <laughs> and uh, it's okay they don't frown on it You're, I've done it for 30 years um, but yeah break the glue out and see how the bristles uh, it, how they naturally fall you want the bristles to fall like this you want them to stay together it's called interlocking so when they interlock they're going to hold more pigment in there if you have some that are doing this those are going to be those hairs will pick up paint while you're painting and you'll end up with like stray marks while you're trying to make a nice clean brush stroke so don't get those all right so that is i think that that covers brush 101 <laughs> so um, we're going to talk about how to clean your brushes next Just this brush in my demo and what you want to do is clean out most of the paint from your brush with your thinner so For the sake of this demo i want to show you um, how far to keep going until you are done cleaning the brush cleaning the brush you I we're gonna go into my bathroom here in the studio and I run it under water in a sink but I always use a rubber glove on my left hand because I'm going to grind this brush into this hand and I really don't want to push the paint into my skin especially since I am using some cadmium I always try to be careful there's no point in pushing chemicals further into our system all right, so I keep a bar of soap in just this little container, and I, when I'm done washing my brushes, I put the soap back in here, and I leave it open to just let it air dry, and then I'm ready to go the next time. All right, so let's go wash this brush. Okay, so when washing my brush, it doesn't matter to me if I use hot or cold water, but I just keep it lukewarm. Got my brush in this hand, just like this, my bar of soap in this hand. And I rub the brush on the bar of soap like this. Rinse, 
rub the brush, rinse, rub the brush. And I'm gonna keep going until the soap is clear. Okay, so get some soap on there. Once I get the big chunks of, of paint off, I'm gonna do this, right in the palm of my hand. And when that soap is starting to come out white and clear, I'll do it one more time. Then I know that my brush is clean. A lot of paint tries to get itself up into the furrow, right up in here. So you may have to work really hard to get that clean. And sometimes it takes me five minutes just to clean one brush. Put the soap back in there, rinse it off again. Just like that. And then I will shake it out, wring out the excess water, and I can reshape it to a nice chiseled edge, just like that. Okay? So I can also take two pieces of cardboard and a paper clip over the top and let it dry overnight if I want to do that too. Okay, so to clean your palette, I want to show you how to do that as well. So some of this paint is still good. That was the good paint. But the rest of this, I'm just going to scrape off. So at the end of your paint session, or sometimes even during the middle of your paint session, if your palette gets too crowded, scrape it all off, and then I dip my, bra my paper towel into the thinner, and I rub it down like this, and then I take it one more step and I get a clean paper towel, and I put a little bit of linseed oil on the surface and I rub that into the palette as well. And I like to do this with my wood palettes because it keeps the finish, it'll make it more like glass over time. And um, it also seems to clean even more, look at that. So I get that down further. I could actually sand all of this old paint off. I just haven't done it yet, but one of these days I'll get to that. <laughs> Okay, so the palette is ready then for the next use. Now what I could do is take these paints off and put them in a plastic Tupperware container and throw it right in the freezer. Um, I'm not going to do that because I'm going to paint with them. And if you paint every day, all you really need to do is just scrape kind of a skin off. If you get a little bit of a skin on your paint, just like that, I turn it inside out and I can work with that pile again. Uh, if you don't want that to happen or you think you may not get to it every day, Carefully put some on the lid of a container. Put the container on the lid, keep it upside down, and put it right in your freezer. They'll keep almost indefinitely. Every time you come out to paint, then you just put your paint back on the palette and you're good to go. And that is your Palette Care 101. Okay, so I want to take a few minutes to talk about painting surfaces. Now there are all sorts of painting surfaces that you can get and I have my preferences. So I'm going to talk to you today first about what I don't like about cotton canvases and then I'm going to go into what I do like uh, going through the list of um, what I don't like, what I do like, what's passable, and then what I really love. So I'm going to show you that next. All right, so this is a, just an inexpensive cotton canvas. It's actually dented. I have no intention of using this for a painting, but I want to show you as a point in case, a little bit about why I don't prefer cotton. Okay, so what I wanna show you up close here is the weave of this cotton. Okay, so if you can see it in here, it, it's so even and perfect, and, um, I, and it's deep. Inside each of these little holes, it's quite a bit deeper than, for example, linen. So I'm gonna show you up close here what the paint does. So let's say you're going along and you're painting and the brush is gliding and doing its thing and you can't get it in the little squares of your canvas. That's very aggravating no matter how much paint you use. And you can really scrub that paint into the canvas or use more linseed oil or thinner and try to get that into there but it's just not gonna fill those grooves unless you use a lot of paint and then you're frustrated because it's 
you, you think it's you and you think, well, why? Painting is hard. <laughs> but I'm telling you, it doesn't have to be this hard. What you can do is you, if you have a whole bunch of cotton canvases, you could actually just go ahead and cover this canvas with gesso. And I'll show you a little bit about that in a minute here. This is a large tub of Liquitex professional grade, super heavy gesso. And I like this one as opposed to other ones because it is thicker and heavier. And scoop it and lay it on. And it gets into those holes that I was struggling with to fill up here. So I am just gonna, and then I can do this to all of my cotton canvases. So you put a thin layer of this on and then you're going to brush it smooth and flat because this palette knife is creating ridges. Scrape that off. Now I won't be able to demonstrate right away because this is of course wet, but um, in this case then I would take and just smooth those ridges out. Now you're going to want to do a couple of coats of this. And in doing this step, you can get rid of a lot of frustration. So go ahead and if you want to buy the cheaper cotton canvases, you're going to need to pick up a tub of acrylic gesso <laughs> and put that on a couple of coats on your canvas. Okay, so there's that. This is a water-based acrylic gesso. Now the jury is still out on whether acrylic is good for a base under oil paintings because oil and water do not adhere. And over time, they've said that it can cause delamination between the layers. I've been painting for 30 years and I've seen it on some, but not on others. So if you buy a good quality and of cotton or whatever, um, good quality gesso, you may not have that problem. Another option you can do is to purchase um, a panel. You can, this is by Gesso Board. Um, sometimes I'm using Masterpiece panels, um, Raymar, whatever. There's lots of companies that are making these panels already done on masonite this one is eighth of an inch thick and this is gesso okay so that is just acrylic gesso you can buy them oil ground gessoed as well or well, primered not gessoed gesso means acrylic primer means oil based okay so this one is acrylic and these are fun and handy to have on hand for just doing some small studies um, another thing I do is I will often buy a roll of linen and so I'll have all this linen around and when you cut enough linen for a canvas to stretch I'm, I'll often have little uh, small frag fragments of uh, linen laying around so little scraps like this of beautiful linen and instead of throwing it away I can do little color studies on these or little gifts for people and then I take the finished painting you can just tape it to a board and the finished painting, then you glue down to a piece of masonite. And to glue canvas to any, any surface, you have to use neutral pH adhesive glue. And just look this up online. Neutral pH adhesive, okay? That is archivally sound by conservators for gluing linen to canvas. I've tried everything. I've tried Elmer's cheap school glue. I've tried... Um, Woodworking glue and nothing works the same. A lot of it peels up off the corner or you end up with bubbles or whatever. So you need this for gluing canvases. Uh, linen canvas I have, I'm gonna demonstrate a little bit on here what the surface is like to paint on as opposed to that cotton that I just showed you. So this one, I did put a coat of oil ground on this canvas, it's an older painting. Um, and I put a coat of oil ground on here. It, it looks just like the acrylic gesso I showed you so I'm not gonna bother getting it out but you work it into the layers and you let that layer dry. For oil ground, it takes a couple of weeks to dry, depending on where you live. <laughs> so I'm gonna show you up close here a little bit more of working on linen. And you'll see how just with quick, simple flicks of the brush, you don't have to work hard to get it into the grooves. So just allowing for my brushwork to play and flip and whatever, it, it sits on the surface and I can be delicate as much as I want without trying to gouge that into the canvas, which is very frustrating. So you can see the difference. All right, so this is linen. And there are different grades of linen. I have some that is top quality Belgium quality, double, triple oil primed, 
um, linen by Claussen's or whatever, and that is like painting on silk. It's absolutely heavenly. This is a painting I did on the acrylic primered panel and um, really enjoy this. You can see though, you can get it very detailed and it has a really nice surface quality. Cotton, but it was a very, very high grade cotton quality um, by Fredericks. I got years ago, rolls and rolls of this. And you can still do a very soft handling of paint and enjoy that subtle flicking of the brush on this grade of cotton, but it was almost what they call portrait weave. It was extremely painting fine. I did, this is a very large linen canvas and I stretched it myself. I have a video out there that where I'm stretching the canvas. And um, again, you can see the difference in quality. You can get much, much higher degree of detail in there if that's what you're looking forward to do. But either way, you're not aggravated and you're not frustrated with trying to get the paint just to be on the canvas. And so, um, that is the difference with linen, okay? All right, well, I hope that that helped you get some solid foundational basics to beginning your oil painting studies. As far as mixing colors, I have a video on that. I'll provide a link below. And um, beginning studies, whether you're doing portraits, still lifes, landscapes, plein air, animals. I've got all sorts of different videos in my on my YouTube channel here. So go ahead and take a look. I'll provide some of those links below in this video so that you can have those just to help you get sort of a refresher course on how to set up your studio. Uh, as far as going out and plein air painting, those videos I have a beginner's guide to plein air painting. Um, I actually bring my daughters with and I show how to set things up and to keep it very simple for that as Please well. Please leave your questions below if you have anything that I didn't cover and you'd like me to talk a little bit more about in the future. But I do want to encourage you to get yourself set up into a place in your home to where you feel like it is a sanctuary where you can go. For some, it is your dining room table or a corner of your bedroom or you take the downstairs or in my case, this was once a garage. <laughs> you can completely redo an environment and make it special and make it uniquely your own. Leave your um, lasting impression of what is beautiful to you. You do not need, uh, you know, the whole huge area, skylights, you know, the whole nine yards, but really just make it special and make it unique to you. All right, you guys, that wraps up this video. I hope that you have a wonderful week and thank you so much for joining me. Don't forget, if you enjoyed this, to like and subscribe. I really appreciate it. And please feel free to share these videos. I definitely feel that the more people that are out there painting, the better the world will be. All right, thanks so much. Bye-bye.